Naturally, when we look at British cars, it's usually all sunshines and Doritos. I mean, the cars across the pond that sit on their own island have always had a little bit of a unique way of building cars. They just make them just like quirky enough that makes you question whether it's a car you truly, really, actually want to own because it's just a little bit confusing. You just don't know everything about them. You know, you look at a Jaguar, okay? It has a tendency to, to create cars that people didn't really care about when it comes to reliability before 2014. You had Lotus that for some unknown reason have a used value of $30,000 for an Elise, regardless as if it has 15,000 miles or 150,000 miles because damn autocrossers, they'll pay $30,000 for any type of Lotus, okay? Then you got Rolls Royce that went through a harder divorce between BMW and Volkswagen than a marriage story. But there's a car manufacturer that's been pretty much through it all, that has retained a good chunk of what made it what it is, even though it kind of changed parents a couple, two, three times. A car that, without a doubt, has done something that nearly no other manufacturer has ever been able to do besides Porsche. I'm Alex, Alex at FI on Instagram, and today, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna be talking about a car that has its own unique identity, a car that has somehow made it through thick and thin of the generations, a car that has formed a following that could just be stronger than my love for ramen. Today, we're gonna be talking about you wanting to own a Mini Cooper S. Fat beat drops. And if you're just jumping into this, allow me to say hi in British. Hi. Welcome to Fitment Industries. And if this is your first time jumping into one of our videos, don't forget to subscribe so we can keep making banging videos like this. And if you're looking for aftermarket wheels, tires, or suspension for your newly acquired Mini Cooper or Mini Cooper S or otherwise, be sure to hit us up over at fitmentindustries.com where we literally have everything for you. It's kind of what we do, we're really good at it. We got a gallery so you can check in what fits your car so you don't end up with bunk fitment. It's pretty cool and we have an airlift sale going on right now. It's pretty much banging. I don't know what else to tell you. And if you're looking to win a free set of ESR multi-piece forged wheels, you can actually check the description link below, pick up one of these tees, a sweatshirt, or a windbreaker. Those things are closing out right now, but it gets you automatically entered into win. It's gonna be a banger. The origins of the Mini Cooper, Date all the way back to a company named BMC and designer Sir Isogonis, Isogonis, Iso, there's too many I's and S's in it, but it's okay. Alex, we're just gonna call him Alex. In the mid 1950s, originally built due to fuel shortage and the constant pressure to create a car that would get your commuting done with decent gas mileage, the Mini was essentially birthed into that dreary, rainy country that we call Yeah. Originally developed as a four cylinder, two door car with a Monocac, monocoque, all right, don't laugh, shell. What that pretty much means is it's just a fancy way to say that the structural system of the Mini Cooper was supported throughout the full body of the car, rather than just being the chassis being welded and bolted to the body. It kept things, kept costs down. It was able to make it so it was a little bit easier to make, and it was overall a pretty good platform to do at the time. There's more science to it, but we really don't have much time for that. Bring it forward a few years, and Alex's friend, John Cooper, a designer and builder for Formula One, saw the Mini Cooper as a potential powerhouse in motorsports. It had all of the beans that it needed, okay? It had, it was small, had a short wheelbase, it was light, it should be able to handle just about everything you needed to throw at it, and it could be gutted relatively easy. After a firm handshake and some tea, the Mini Cooper was built in 1961, and shortly thereafter started to provide motorsport-like activities with this little tiny coupe car. They would feature an 848cc engine for the standard Cooper and a 1071cc motor for the S-Type. That's a motorcycle right there. The cars would start to catch wind at that point, being in the Monte Carlo rallies of the mid 60s and in the original, original, original. Italian job. Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch were second to that jam, okay? You can watch that movie later. But the Mini Cooper name didn't live that long, really only from 1961 to 1971. And then again from 1990 to 2000. And then again from like 2003 to 
2000 now. I mean, due to Mini licensing their Cooper name over the Innocenti name out of Spain and some other odd little deals to get the car, the production resources it needed, it started to get a little bit of a weird life. The car in the 90s was introduced by the Rover Group, who owned rights to the Mini at the time, but was ultimately bought out by BMW because Rover was having no fun staying alive. You didn't know that, Rover just really isn't good at keeping cash. Rover would ultimately be sold, but BMW would keep the Mini mark and be reintroduced the Mini in 2000. It's pretty much like divorce, I'm telling you. All right, even with the changes and licensing battles, the car was still named European Car of the Century. A few years later, it would come to the States and decimate all without having any overnight parts from Japan. Americans loved this car. I mean, they did, like, loved. The Mini Cooper came in more trims than shoes my wife wears, and it did everything fairly well. I mean, when you used it in tandem with BMW's own R&D department, the Mini Cooper and Mini Cooper S that hit the States would feature all sorts of interesting little quirks and techs. I'm gonna keep going, even though I almost just fell out of my chair. Not too much horsepower out of the base Cooper, but the S would feature about 170, which was a good chunk of change for the little tiny toaster car, you know? You get it with a manual gearbox or an automatic, which had drive-by wire electronic throttles and a revised suspension system. It was actually a pretty well done car. By keeping it small, keeping it short, and keeping it tight, it was a pretty much a banger to drive. The first generation would last until 2006, until the second generation took over. Second generation, it had more power, baby. All right, there, I said it. Moving from a supercharger to a twin scroll turbocharger, this would move it to mid 170 horsepower. Because it was doing well, BMW would allow the Mini to get a little bit more beefed up with more tech, more options, and a little bit more pizzazz and it would become the generation where people like you and people like me really started to see the Mini Cooper S as a platform to have fun with. The third generation would jump into the pool in 2014 and would be the one that we have now. Stock Coopers would come with a three cylinder, all right, 134 horsepower engine with some insane mileage. And the S would get a two liter, four cylinder turbocharger again at 189 horsepower and a longer body to fit a few more golf clubs and a couple more groceries. The cars would get some love from celebrities like Madonna, all right, Mindy Culling, all right, Katie Holmes, Britney Spears, Blake Lively, all right, my wife loves Blake Lively. These cars are insanely customizable from the factory if you've got the money for it, and there are absolutely no signs of slowing down. And celebrities really love these cars because they were quirky little and you could do little things to them, and they were cute, and they drove well, and they were fun, and it was just a good time, and they were kind of like an upscaled Kia Soul. I mean, but that's besides the point. We're not here to talk about the history of these cars, okay? Seems a little bit counterintuitive, I know. But we're here to talk about you wanting to actually own one of these bad boys, okay? Well, set down your limited edition Italian job DVD and grab your favorite toothbrush because we're about to jump into what it's like to actually own one of these things. Starting it right in the beginning of the 2000s, Mini Cooper and the Mini Cooper S have a ton of success for normal Joes and Janes. But modification support didn't immediately follow. It actually ended up taking a few years for people to start throwing things like the Mini Cooper and the Mini Cooper S right on the ground. But once they did, you had proper toaster status. It was beautiful. Most first gens run airlift performance for their suspension option and more affordable wheels in the narrow sizes like 16 by eights and things like that. That is because they're missing a lug. Most of them are four lug except the newest generation. And they have some fairly limited options unless you do a five lug swap, which isn't very common on these cars. Second and third generation Mini Coopers get bigger and beefier, which is when you start to see these cars get a little bit modified more than just wheels, tires, and suspension they got from fitmentindustries.com. Just saying. And turbo modifications, you get yourself your tune, your intake, exhaust, all that good stuff are all things that you can modify on the Mini Cooper S platform. And it's gonna be relatively okay, okay? Doing this can turn them into little spirited machines, okay? When they aren't broken down. And that is where it starts to get a little bit hyphy about when you want to own one of these. Because I'm sorry, I had to talk about it. Don't at me or whatever the cool trendy thing is these days. Mini Cooper S's can be the CEOs of breaking your heart because they just don't have the best reliability. Okay, JD Power in 2016 ranked the Mini as the fifth 
worst brand for reliability. The S's, while they do perform, do have their fair share of issues. And if you just don't even want to trust me, you can just go ask our buddy Charlie, who's on his like third block and fourth turbo or something like that, because he just continues to send power through it and just continues to blow up. They can have cooling issues because of just the way that they were built. Engine failure because of, well, I hate to spoil it, the way that they were built. Plastics shake loose on the inside. They have body hardware issues and they do have a couple other things. The automatic CVT transmission is a disaster to work with and it's not something that you would ever want to get. Stay away from them. 02 to 06 models have a known defect in the strut tower, which literally makes them bend. Pre-2000s have a potential for power steering to go out due to overheating and poor cooling. The early S models with the supercharger need to be rebuilt around every 100,000 miles. 07 and 08s had an internal engine failure that happened at cold start, which caused a bunch of noise and rattling. And even though Mini Coopers and Mini Cooper S's have some of these well-known issues that people aren't afraid to talk about, People still run these bad boys because they don't care. They are a blast to drive when they are performing as they're supposed to, and they can perform in just about any setting. You wanna go tackle some cones? Go get them, son, all right? HPD, go grab a helmet and give it your best toss down RA. Need something that pops flames with the tune that might be due to engine failure? Hey, I mean, why not, right? Mini Coopers have fantastic history that does make them a fun platform with a ton of stuff that would make you proud to own one of the cars. They have a unique look that the company has never really deviated from and is, that's probably why such a large group of people will buy them over and over and over even with their less than stellar reliability ratings or they just have a warranty. I mean warranties are like safety net of the, the century. If you do end up snagging one of these, you're going to want to make sure you keep an eye out on those common issues that we talked about before. It's also important to remember that you're buying a four lug car for your wheels, which limits options unless you get third gens or multi-piece wheels. And of course, remember that you're going to have peculiar things you'll need to work on and around as you modify. There's a dog. Dog? Dog? Puppy? There are some peculiar things you'll need to work around as you modify these cars as they aren't as stable as we would like them to be, which is pretty much the same to say for most car guys and gals in a relationship in 2020. But it's besides the point. If you do end up picking up a Mini Cooper, just make sure you check in that maintenance, make sure that you're okay with working on them a few times, and of course, don't forget to just throw it on the ground. So what do you think about the Mini Cooper and Mini Cooper S? Drop your comments below and of course, let us know what you'd like us to talk about next. If you have a Mini Cooper, tell us if you love it below. And if you look for aftermarket wheels, tires, or suspension for your Mini Cooper or otherwise, be sure to check us out over at fitmentindustries.com. I'm Alex from Fitment Industries. We will see you later. Peace. Whoa.